All right, I'd like to welcome everybody officially to the Be Human Project Managing the Unmanageables Salon. Though we're going to find out very quickly that it's not really unmanageable at all. This heat is a bit unmanageable, but <laughs> outside of that, we ask you to bear with us on that. Um, I'm James O'Brien, the new executive director uh, of the Be Human Project. Thank you so much. And uh, we are here tonight with a deep sense of gratitude and of loss. But um, I am happy to be able to share with you and to confirm that we have some good news in that we received our 501c3 status from the IRS. And so we are official. And, uh, and so that's good news for our sponsors as well, who I'd really like to thank um, Scott Hunsicker of Arden. Scott? Right right, thank you so much. Scott Hester, CEO of Councilman Hunsicker. Scott's back there. Thank you so much, Scott. A very special thank you to Butch and Jan Frick, who are always there for us. Thank you so much. And our awesome production team at Spot Media Production. Guys, thank you. This makes this so special. And please feel free to contribute your thoughts in our podcast studio uh, after the event in the uh, back of the agency here, or also in our video studio. So we have two ways for you to participate, as well as to ask uh, questions and answers um, after the salon here. Um, I would also like to thank the Shafley Corporation for our beer, which is awesome. Yeah. And Swift Printing for our collateral. Um, and most of all, I want to thank the awesome team at Big Wide Sky for making the Human Project possible at all. Um, and with that, I owe not just an introduction, but a debt of gratitude to my good friend, um, the CEO of Big Wide Sky, the founder of Be Human Project, and our moderator tonight, Elliot Freck. Thank you. So um, I, I just, uh, I don't want to take too much time because I'm really excited about Jurgen being here. <clears throat> we're, we're, uh, we're lucky that he's here in St. Louis. Uh, he's on a North American book tour for Managing for Happiness right now, and his schedule is just packed. And I think he had like two dates available, and we, so we were lucky to get him here to St. Louis for this. And in just a little bit of time, I'm, so I read his book. I don't, you, you all should have gotten a copy. If you get a chance, please read it. I, I, I just finished it recently. It is a great deal of fun. It's a great book. And it's, you know, it's about subjects that are very close to my heart. I think uh, you know Mr. Reimer here, who's sitting in the third row, who is also a, a great friend to uh, Be Human Project. Uh, his work is, I think, uh, something that you would find re resonant with your work as well. So, uh, so we're we're lucky to have him here. But I just want to give you a little bit of background, really quickly, about Be Human Project. Uh, our mission is to embolden leaders of businesses and organizations to experiment with making their organizations and businesses more human. Um, and by that we mean a human organization is one that supports the social capital of all the people in its network. And what we mean by that is that uh, human organizations help the people that are inside the company, help, help their, their partners and their vendors, and help their customers to, to do more, to, to do what, whatever they can do to support their ability to be the best that they can be. And uh, organizations tend to be very reductionist, very determinist in the way that they understand the people with whom they interact. And that doesn't give them, give them the visibility that they need to understand how valuable these human beings are. Uh, and that, in fact, these human beings are the reason why these organizations exist in the first place. Um, and so we've been fortunate. We, we, one of the ways in which we try to, to embolden leaders is we create these experiences, these salons. And we've, we've had four of them now. Our first one was with a, a, a dear friend of mine, a man named Peter Stropel, who I have a great affection for, who, who spoke to us about the importance of trust in networks. He's, he's known as the most connected man in America. And it sounds sort of, uh, sort of dubious. Uh, like you wonder if perhaps he's a Scientologist or something, but he's not. He's, 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 a, he's just an extraordinary guy who, who creates what he calls instant change by earning and building trust very quickly uh, and connecting people who are doing amazing things. And he does it over and over and over again, and he cares deeply about trust. So we focused on trust in that first salon. Um, the second salon that we did uh, was with um, 
was with Dave Gray, who is a very dear friend of mine, and he spoke about the importance of culture and how culture works and how we can understand culture within organizations and how we can support the best possible cultures um, and how we can also understand the ways in which our culture will undermine our best attempts to try to uh, do things with policy or do things with strategy. Um, and then after that, we had uh, our, our very dear friend, Chris Reimer, who had uh, just published his book, Happy Work, which if you haven't read it, you should pick up a copy and read it as soon as you can. And he talked about the future of work um, and, and what it might look like and how we can have a workplace that feels more human. Um, and then in our last salon, uh, we, had, we were very uh, honored to have a, as a guest a woman named Dr. Kathy Kramer. Now, uh, Kathy is a, it's an IO psychologist. Uh, who had wrote nine books over her career. She was on Oprah several times. Uh, she, uh, she was uh, deeply important in uh, what Jurgen might call uh, the management 2.0 world, um, but uh, spoke very deeply uh, and, and poignantly about the need to, uh, to have everyone be seen, to have everyone be heard and have their voices heard and be a part of, of what happens. Now, sadly, Kathy passed uh, just just last week, just last Wednesday. And this morning I attended her funeral. Um, and she, she was extraordinarily special. And so I would like to, uh, uh, forgive me for, for hijacking our purpose, but I would like to dedicate this salon to her. And we have just a, a little, uh, little two-minute video that I'd like to share with you very quickly, uh, containing some quotes and s some footage of her from our last salon, uh, just because I want to share with you how special and important she was to us. If you think you know how this is all, all going to play out and how you're going to do it, that is worse than self-doubt. <laughs> the conversation about values is really very important. And um, I think compassion and empathy, you know, the whole emotional intelligence realm talks about how, how is it that you manage yourself, your own um, emotions, how is it that you know them and manage them, and then how do you stand in the other person's shoes? And so that, and help the other person regulate. So not being afraid of being afraid. Being mindful is about noticing, noticing. And so what you're talking about is noticing your own values and noticing the value of the person or the situation right on in front of you. So it's a very active. So it's not judging, but it's noticing what is here to be worked with. I think leading is about learning about how to lead all the time, every time. I believe, actually, that the leader, you know, as you are honing your internal skill set, you are the most powerful force that drives the positive change. When you are in touch, really, with your fundamental sense of your own purpose and what you have to give, that is the magnetic uh, force that draws people to you. So, uh, we were very, very uh, honored, and uh, and and it was a gift to 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 have her a part of of what we were doing with the Be Human Project. She believed really deeply in our ideas, and um, and she was an incredible friend, and she was an incredible client, and uh, and 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 I believe she probably gave more to us in terms of the counseling that she gave us for free. <laughs> than she got from us <laughs> that she paid for. <laughs> but uh, but she, so her spirit animates a lot of what we do. And I sat with her just moments before she passed and I promised her that I would finish my book um, because she, she repeatedly asked me to do so. <laughs> uh, 
she wrote nine of them. I haven't even been able to get one done. Uh, but uh, but so, so, so I, I appreciate you all humoring me, give, uh, taking this opportunity to share with you how deeply she moved me and how important she was to me. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I believe that her, her ideas and her spirit will animate what we're doing with the Be Human Project for, for a long time to come. And it, it is in the spirit of that kind of thinking. Um, in fact, I'm sorry, let me tell you just one really quick anecdote. Um, I, I saw Kathy stand with someone who I care a great deal about, um, someone who, uh, who is not always comfortable with direct social interactions. And Kathy stood with, this is a moment that no one saw but me. And Kathy stood with this person and she looked her directly in the eyes and she thanked her for the work that, that she did for Kathy. And there was a moment of awkwardness because it's, you know, it's not often that people do that kind of thing, that they communicate with people in that way, especially in a business context. And she stood there and she held this person's hands and she looked her in the eyes and Kathy was like 5'1". And the person to whom she was speaking is about 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, and so she's looking up at her and she did not let go of her hands until, and you could see the tension in this person's body because she's so good at what she does but she's not comfortable with receiving praise like this. You see that, and she, and Kathy looked her in the eyes until she, she calmed down, and it was one of the most beautiful moments I have ever seen in my entire life. And so, um, so it, is that, it is creating that kind of experience for people and allowing them to see what they could do and what's possible uh, that I think is an important part of what we're trying to do with the Human Project. It's why we gathered such an incredible group of people, because we wanted to uh, try to create something of the order of that kind of experience for you. And that's why we're really very fortunate to have with us uh, Jurgen. And you're going to have to help me. I, I've never pronounced your last name in a way that Fry. I... <laughs> a, a Pella, you, you, have a, you have a Northern European first name and a Southern European last name. No, no, no. no How does this work? <laughs> How, Apello? Johan Apollo. Apollo. All right. So we're very, very, very grateful to have Jürgen here with us tonight. Um, and I think he's going to give you the kind of experience that I was just speaking about. So... Thanks, Eli. Jürgen. Let me, do you mind if I put this one on the side? It's, yes, I like please, to here. walk around when, yeah, I, when here. I... Yeah, this is how I exercise. Actually, the city nearly killed me this morning because I went for a run at 6.30. I got up very early in the morning and I went 10 kilometers. I don't know how many miles that is, about seven or something, seven, eight, seven miles, uh, all the way to the, to the golf course and then, and then back. I barely survived. <laughs> <laughs> but survive I did. <laughs> in the heat that was already upcoming. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And um, I have to warn you, I'm going to apologize in advance. I am Dutch. I'm sorry for that. I, I always do that uh, I, because um, I, I'm actually Dutch, but I live in Brussels, Belgium, which is sort of the informal capital of, of the European Union. And uh, my partner works for the European Council, works for the European Commission. I know how people think about each other, and the Dutch are famous for being blunt. <laughs> <laughs> being rude, basically, is what everyone else says. We call it honesty, of course. <laughs> we call it openness. <laughs> Uh, so you might recognize that every now and then uh, during the next uh, 25 minutes or so. Actually, there's one thing that I, that, I, that I love pointing out is that in many languages there's this expression of not stepping on a person's toes, which is not to offend them, right? Uh, in many languages they have that. We have that as well in Dutch, but also we have the opposite expression, which we use more often, which is uh, uh, other people sometimes have long toes. <laughs> It's, it's just impossible not to step on them. <laughs> we see it like completely from the opposite perspective. So uh, anyways, it's, it's great to be here. And uh, yeah, this is working. Let me, let me tell you a bit about, about myself. I've been a manager for many years. I've been uh, working as a CIO, Chief Information Officer at a company in Rotterdam, my hometown. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say this in a city known for beer, but you have heard of Heineken, perhaps? <laughs> well, that was one of our biggest customers. We made all their websites. Um, and I managed the IT department there. Um, and I have other experiences uh, a, long, uh, a longer time ago. And I was, uh, I was pretty bad at management, basically. I was, I was actually a software engineer 
and I was turned into a manager because probably I was so bad at programming that my <laughs> team members begged our CEO to promote me away into a management position where I could do less harm. Um, and uh, I had no idea how to work with people. For me, uh, software developers were computers on legs with hair. That's, that's how I managed them, basically. <laughs> and um, that meant that I was treating the organization like a machine. And that is what I've seen many other managers around the world do as well. They think about people as parts, as resources, etc. Um, and uh, I was pretty bad. I worked for some companies, including my own startup at the time, that collapsed. At one time I even joked that maybe you shouldn't hire me or you should perhaps hire me and make me work for your competitors so I could, <laughs> I could manage them to, to a distinction, basically. <laughs> uh, but nowadays I travel the world uh, and offering people advice. Somehow people want to hear my opinions on how to manage businesses. So I learned a few things and that's what I will try to share with you uh, these, uh, this, this half hour. I'll give you some examples, some things that I've started doing differently. Like I, I know that it is, it is useful to, to change, introduce change uh, when you're uh, combining it with food because people are more uh, open to suggestions and ideas when you're having food together. So uh, eating uh, is, is a great idea. And um, I once uh, did that by inviting my colleagues to my house for dinner. I had a spreadsheet with random with, with the names of everyone, and I invited six random people, like uh, two programmers, an account manager, uh, program manager, uh, a system administrator, and the chief vice president of the pencils and paper clips or something. <laughs> and I invited them to my house, and when they arrived, I told them, and now you do the cooking. Surprise! <laughs> so this is them cooking. <laughs> And uh, the two programmers spontaneously started making the main course and the account manager worked with the project manager to prepare the appetizers and the system administrator might take care of the desserts. And being a system administrator, he did not allow anyone access to the chocolate, of course, <laughs> without permission and filling out some forms. And, um, and I was managing, which meant I was just looking at hardworking people and taking pictures. <laughs> typical management role, I suppose. And I call that management 3.0. That is, uh, in, my, in my terminology, it is managing the system and not the people. I will re repeat that a few times. So that if there's one takeaway, that, is, that should be the takeaway. I manage the environment for them to be happy and productive together. And uh, it was quite successful. I did it six or seven times and I got questions from the rest of the organization. Hey, when is it my turn? I heard people have been cooking for you at your house. That's ridiculous. <laughs> when do I get an invite? I can cook. <laughs> so uh, it was quite a successful idea. Uh, another thing that I did was uh, I, I, I said to my CEO at the time, uh, we, never, we never celebrate anything around here. We should every now and then stand still and appreciate the things that we've achieved. Uh, our accomplishments or our learnings. He said, okay, what do you suggest? I said, well, maybe something that makes some noise because we had a big open office space, a former factory that was redesigned as an, as an office. So I said, maybe a bell or, or something. Two weeks later, he came to my desk with a big copper ship's bell. He said, here's your bell, now do something useful with it. And I was like, whoa, awesome, where did you get this? So I went with the bell to the office police, the office manager, I mean, sorry. <laughs> and I asked her to place the bell near the coffee machine. And from that moment, anyone was allowed to ring the bell for any reason. It, there was no rule, just ring the bell and we will celebrate. And they celebrated big new releases or a customer or sometimes a baby delivered by a person, not by the company, of course. <laughs> And um, it met the bell added some playfulness to the office. It also added huge noise <laughs> for about three or four seconds. And then 100 people would gather around the coffee machine to learn what the celebration was all about. The last time I heard the bell, by the way, was when the CEO announced to the whole company that I had quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> and that is not a lie. <laughs> It might have saved the company, I think. <laughs> Anyways, 
So these are some examples of things that I started doing differently as opposed uh, compared to other managers and they worked. The people liked it and they were happier. One thing that I was particularly proud of at the time was that turnover in my part of the organization dropped from about 15-70% to nearly zero. Nobody wanted to go away anymore. They were enjoying their jobs. I introduced agile thinking, self-organizing teams, I made those teams responsible for their own planning, etc., etc., and, and, and they, they loved that. Uh, and I started writing about that and that became a book and well the rest is history and one of the reasons why I'm standing here. And I've tried to sort of summarize some of my learnings uh, into a couple of, uh, a couple of statements that you'll, that you'll find here. There's, there's no one, one way of organizing a company, of course. There's no best, best, one best practice. But a couple of things that I learned are, first of all, it is, it is good to offer people meaning. The reason why we're doing things, you'll have to explain that. We're not just selling widgets. There's reason for us selling widgets. It should be a means to an end. So build for meaningful products and services. That requires us to be innovative in the way we offer those, uh, those widgets, that we produce them, and the way we manage the organization. That needs innovation as well. This requires us to learn faster because innovation requires learning and the world is accelerating faster and faster. So learn at an accelerated pace. Scientists and researchers know that learning is optimal when we run more experiments. That also includes as managers we have to run experiments with our people as I did. I, I invited people to my house and said, now you cook. <laughs> that was an experiment. <laughs> it was a successful experiment. Well, these experiments uh, uh, remind, remind me of, of uh, 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 playing. As children, we learned long ago that experimentation, trying things out, is part of playing. That is uh, 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 crucial as human beings. Well, we only play when we're having fun, when we're feeling good, when we're feeling happy. Unhappy people don't play that much. Finally, we cannot make people happy as managers, but we can definitely manage the system for more happiness, create an environment for happiness. And uh, I call those the seven silver bullets. Those are seven silver bullets for, uh, for uh, 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 better management. Start with managing the system for happiness and end with more innovative uh, products and the building for meaning. For the Managers in this room, I have another version of this slide, by the way, where I present everything as seven boring bullet points. <laughs> that is, and with some, with some clip art, go, something going up. And with an eye for de detail, I even used uh, the fonts Times New Roman and Comic Sans. <laughs> I'm a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> Anyways. So I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple more examples. Um, things that I have uh, done uh, uh, to, to make our organization a little bit more successful. Did you know that the word management is actually from the Italian word managiare? It means leading or taking care of horses. Isn't that interesting? Management is uh, from managiare. In my language, in Dutch, manege is a place where we stable horses. It comes from the same root. Management. Fascinating. It's a great metaphor. So the organization is not a machine, it's like a horse. It's a living system. We should take care of it and nurture it and feed it and love it and hopefully it doesn't kick us in the face. That is what management is about, leading the horse. Now sometimes I am at conferences and people tell me, we don't need managers, we have self-organizing teams. Let's get rid of all the managers. We want an organization without managers. Uh, I don't really agree. I do know that there's a lot of bad management out there. Totally in agreement there. But no management is not a good alternative, in my opinion. Because a fully self-organizing team or a fully self-organizing company, that would be like a wild horse. It's completely unconstrained. And I don't know about you, I have little experiences with horses, but I'm not going to sit on a wild horse and slap his ass and say, yee and then hope, <laughs> hope and pray that it runs in the right direction. 
that doesn't sound like the kind of management and leadership that I'm after. Right? So I like that metaphor. It means that we have to sort of make some boundaries, create some boundaries, a fence somewhere <laughs> that we need the bridles and the spurs. The horse pretty much decides for itself what it wants to do, but it will be constrained somehow. And that's an interesting metaphor. Now, this constraining means that we delegate things to a certain extent, to that self-organizing team or the organization. And that is where things get interesting, because many managers do not understand that delegation is like a spectrum of choices that you have. Mm -hmm. They only think of two things, dictatorship and anarchy. Like, either I do stuff or you do stuff. But there are plenty of colorful positions in between. So uh, I've tried to explain that with, uh, with a simple model that I call the seven de uh, delegation levels. Let me give you uh, some examples. Oops. So level one is tell. I tell people what my decision is as a, uh, as a manager. And uh, like vacation days, I tell you, you go on vacation in July from the 27th uh, to August 17th. You go on vacation from August 18th. That would be dictatorship, right? That's clear. Level two is I try to convince people of my decision. Level three is consult, asking them for their opinion. That is sort of the default in some organizations. People tell the managers when they want to go on vacation and the manager signs uh, the forms. Level four is let's agree together. That will be the typical Dutch solution. We talk and talk and talk until someone dies of exhaustion. <laughs> And then the survivor makes the decision, basically. <laughs> Level five is advice. Now the self-organizing team makes the decision, but I make suggestions. Like, it would be smart not to go on vacation all at the same time. <laughs> Level six is you do what you want, but inform me. It would be nice for me to know who was on vacation when. And level seven is full delegation. Every day is a complete surprise who was at the office and who was not. <laughs> that would be anarchy, right? Now, these seven delegation levels are symmetrical. I like that of this, uh, of this model. And you can, you can visualize delegation. Uh, there are some uh, organizations and teams trying to clarify for teams and, and departments what, what the, where the constraints are, basically. Where is the fence? Uh, and you can do that in, in various forms. Like this is a, a, a picture that I got from the Netherlands, which is awesome. Okay, you can see that this is a Dutch picture, by the way. Is a Dutch delegation board. Uh, has anyone ever flown into Schiphol Airport? Has anyone ever seen, um, uh, looked outside and looked how nice and straight those fields are there? That's typically Dutch, because Dutch people like, uh, like uh, uh, order, but we also like freedom at the same time. So what you saw down there is all probably, is probably marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> But we don't care what you grow, as long as you grow it in a straight line. That's, just, <laughs> that's very important to us Dutch. We, we can't have anarchy, right? So it's the same here. We have, uh, we have seating arrangement, apparently. So there's a manager told people where they sit. You sit there, you sit there, you sit there. But at the same time, salary is delegated all the way to level six. You pay yourself anything you want. I don't care, as long as you stay seated on the right chair. That's important, right? We cannot have people pay themselves salary from any chair, that will be, that will be anarchy. <laughs> so interesting conflict between freedom and, and, and order. Anyways, a couple of more from Poland, where they invented a new level zero, as you can see. <laughs> that probably means I'm not even going to tell them what my decision is. <laughs> from Germany, complicated. <laughs> And various, uh, various others. I will bo spare you the details. You can play with the game Delegation Poker, m30.me slash Delegation Poker. You can find it later, I'm quite sure. To have these delegation levels surface from discussions and get people's assumptions on the table to understand how, where the horse thinks that the, that the fence is, basically. Interesting conversations that you can have with your, with your team. But uh, I have a few more uh, suggestions. Uh, but first, let me focus on that, uh, that happiness uh, topic. There's, a, there's an interesting question here. Does success lead to happiness or does happiness lead to success? This is, uh, people are not in agreement about this, interestingly enough. I saw an, uh, a quote from Sean Aker in The Happiness Advantage, 
We now know that happiness is the precursor to success, not merely the result. But Phil Rosenzweig in The Halo Effect, another book that I gave five stars, he's a professor, he knows what he's talking about. Does employee satisfaction lead to high performance? Probably, but the reverse effect is stronger. Hmm. But he mentioned satisfaction, not happiness, which some people equate, but other people say, no, it's not the same thing. Complicated. Complex, even. Well, whatever uh, is the case, um, we know for a fact that happiness makes people more productive. So there is a return on investment there, if we could even look at it from a cynical perspective. It makes sense to have happier people in the organization. Now what are the things that make people happy? I was thinking about that a few years ago. I remember I was in Argentina at the time, which is an interesting company, uh, country by the way. Nothing works, everyone is happy <laughs> in Argentina. Really, I got at the airport, all the cash machines were broken and they all had a different error message. It was very interesting. So, and in the city as well, it wasn't just impossible to get any cash. So I was at one moment sitting, sipping a cocktail in a bar that I had to pay for by reselling the contents of my mini bar of the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was doing the research into the happiness topic, meta research basically, researching the research. Lots of stuff available there. These are the 12 things that I found make people happy. Thank someone and be appreciative of other people. Give something to another person every now and then. Um, help someone who is in need of assistance. Eat well, healthy foods. I had a salad this afternoon, very good. Exercise, I ran this morning, I work out. Rest well, sleep sufficiently. Experience new things, try stuff out. Hike outdoors, enjoy nature. Uh, meditate, mindfulness practices. Uh, socialize, hang out with people, with friends. Uh, aim for a goal, a purpose, also within your work. And smile whenever you can, even when you have to fake it. <laughs> and those are the 12 steps to happiness. And uh, researchers agree that these things are all contributing to happiness. And <clears throat> what I learned again and again is that happiness is not an outcome, it is a decision that you make. It is just something that you can do every day to be a happier person. As John Aker said, it is a path, it is not a destination. There is no destination, it's just the path that you're walking. So every day there's a chance to do something that makes people happy. Also, as a manager, I remember one time I took my software developers, software teams outside into the sun to have some code reviews. I told them just print a few lines of code and we will get out there uh, into the fresh air. They thought it was odd. <laughs> I, had, I had to like almost literally drag them from their caves into the fresh air. Like, oh my god, it's so bright, it's so bright. That's the sun, you idiot. That's the real thing. You can't, you can't swipe it off. So just sit over here and, and then we had a code review. And that was so much fun and they enjoyed that. It was be more human in the things that we had to, had to do. I called it hiking. It was just a few yards, I admit, but <laughs> it was... <laughs> It was, uh, it was a long way for some people. <laughs> Anyways, 12 steps to happiness. And uh, that's one of the, some of the things that, uh, that I, uh, that I uh, discovered. I have two more suggestions. One is, um, one is about uh, uh, values. Um, does anyone recognize from which company I stole this picture? Our values are responsibility and sustainability. No, no, no. Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Our values are responsibility and sustainability. Uh huh. <laughs> it's probably a rare case of German humor, right? So there's a there's something missing here, which is a feedback cycle between what people say that they do and what they actually do. That is missing in many organizations. I uh, I find sadly. So what I try to do with my team is make sure that there is a feedback cycle. For example, we use Slack with a, uh, where I have a value stories channel, where we actually share stories of how we're trying to live up to our values. Shortening the feedback cycle, because nobody can remember value lists. 
like seven or five bullet points or whatever, this is what we stand for, which is useful to have those. But people remember stories, so when they're sharing stories of each other, living up to those values, those get remembered. I know some companies having handbooks and culture books, like for example, Zappos is famous for having a culture book that you can even, even download, lovely pictures and, and uh, photos and uh, illustrations. Uh, IDEO has a, has a culture book. And all these organizations are trying to close the feedback loop, basically, between what they say what they're doing versus what they're actually doing. I read some organizations have annual values days with exactly the same uh, meaning. We should get together and share stories because the human brain is wired to remember stories, not bullet-pointed lists. We cannot remember those. But stories, oh, we're great at storytelling. Uh, so we should share more stories. I love this quote, by the way, the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. It's a bit cynical, perhaps. If there's something happening in the organization that you do, when you do not intervene, it's a bad thing, then that will be the baseline of your culture. It got thousands of retweets last year. Very popular quote. I sort of changed it into this one. I think it's more positive. The culture of any organization is shaped by the best behavior the leader is willing to amplify, shine a light on the good behaviors. Sadly, this did not get thousands of retweets yet. <laughs> <sighs> Working on it. <laughs> but they mean the same thing. Right? It's all about those, sharing those stories. All right. Last four, uh, four minutes. You probably know about this, uh, this practice, the bonus system. You've heard of it, <clears throat> right? It goes like this, traditionally, for the ones who have never heard of bonus systems before. People get a steady amount of money, and then by the end of the year, some people get a lot more. And usually, uh, what is applied is what scientists call Zipf's Law, or the Pareto Principle, or the 80-20 Rule, which means 80% disappears in the pocket of the manager, and 20% goes to the next layer below. <laughs> and this repeats at every management layer, until by the time you get to the bottom, nothing is left. That's why they call that trickle-down economics. <laughs> by the time you get to the bottom, there is nothing. It is no surprise that many employees don't like this type of bonus system. That's why some people say, let's get rid of bonuses. We shouldn't do that. It makes everyone unhappy, or at least most people. And I do not agree. I do not agree for a very important reason, which is entitlement. Did you know that 70% of drivers in the world think they are above average drivers? Makes no sense. Right? <laughs> I read once somewhere that 80% of college professors think they are above average college professors. Now these are smart people. They should understand the concept of average and 50%. Right? <laughs> and they, they measured this. I read in Science Daily a few months ago. They did research. They asked people. How much, in terms of a percentage, did you contribute to the team's result? They added the percentages, and guess how much they came up with? 3,000. <laughs> well, 140 was the average. And it correlated with the size of the team. So the bigger the team, the higher people overestimated their own contribution. So what happens if you, if you do this? If you do not distinguish between those who contributed more versus those who contributed less, most people will think they're underpaid. It won't be true, but 70 or 80 percent will think they actually deserve more, and they will not be happy right, with this arrangement. So I prefer to do something else. I have a steady amount of income with my team, and every now and then I give some people something extra. This is how we do that. Every team at the start of a month has 100 points, and throughout the rest of the month they credit each other for their performance like 10 points to Vorans for helping me out today, 5 points to Sergei for your super fast response time, uh, 10 points to Pilar for not killing me when I screwed up the web server or things like that. And these points accumulate over time. Every month it gets, gets higher. And as the business owner, every month I set aside some bonus money depending on the performance of the whole system. What, what, what I can spare, uh, basically. And like a jackpot, this money also builds up over time. So the only thing left to do is to pick a good moment to decide 
who gets how much based on the points that they receive from each other and the money that I have available. This is how we do that. Okay, guys. Oh, come on, baby, money. <laughs> Everyone, give it a kiss. <laughs> come on, come on, lucky dice. We love you, we love you. Oh, it's a sink. Yeah! Oh, Can you see? Can you see that? So we have a simple company rule that I came up with. At the start of the month, one person throws a dice and it has to be recorded, it has to be on video. And if that person throws a six, we pay out bonuses. No six, no bonus. That's it. That's simple. And then the money just carries over to the next month. And uh, that makes sure that people have absolutely no idea when the next bonus is paid out. It could be next month, it could take years. <laughs> Theoretically, right. We all know what happens when people are promised a bonus in December, right? They will have spent the money before they even received it. And when it's less than expected, again, they will be demotivated, unhappy. And not on my team, they, they love the bonus system. They think it's like their own little Las Vegas casino. <laughs> and they can only win, <laughs> which is awesome. By the way, the one who threw the dice was Louise. Uh, sadly, she, she left us because she wanted to have more time for her family, but she was, was the dice thrower because she had a lucky hand, according to the team. <laughs> she, she, dice. She, or, could be, because she threw a six like three times in 11 months. That was, we considered renting her out to people in casinos. Right? Anyways. These are all examples, I'm wrapping up now, uh, these are all examples of me trying to manage the system and not the people, and hopefully you recognize that here. I do not decide who gets how much, I have no idea. The crowd knows more of each other's behavior than I do as a manager. I'm too far away of the day-to-day -day activities. I do decide on the budget, that's my decision, but they do the paying themselves. And it's all in line with crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and all those movements that we find now uh, nowadays. So, it starts with managing the system for more happiness. It ends with, hopefully, innovative management and uh, meaningful products and services. You have this book. I see a number of copies here, which is awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, the reason I made it a very colorful is to show that management itself can also be a very colorful job. I even use the color pink. Yes, oh why God. not? <laughs> I got compliments for that. Oh, you use pink. Yeah, sure, it's just a color. <laughs> What's wrong with pink? So um, uh, it's a very colorful book because management itself can be a colorful job uh, too. Why always so gray and, and dark and dark blue, etc. And I already gave my new friend Liam, I gave one of these, a copy of, uh, of my book plate sticker. They're over here. Happy to sign them for you and officially stickerize your book. Right? <laughs> well, <laughs> some people like that. <laughs> so uh, it's great being here. Thank you so much. And maybe you'll have some questions. So we, we, we always want is as much as possible with as much time as you all are willing to spend sitting in this unnecessarily warm room. Um, uh, to, to, to have a conversation about this. Uh, you know, we, we work really hard to invite the most interesting people that we know. And so, you are they. Uh, so, so it is our anticipation that you have some thoughts, questions, insights that you'd like to share, have some conversation about. And uh, I, Elena has, is that, that, I don't, is that the mic? That's the mic. Okay, so Elena has the mic. So uh, anyone who has a question, a thought, anything would like to ask Jurgen, please, please share. So we got Dr. Mike. Second uh, one. Uh, yes. Yeah. As a manager myself, working for four large Fortune 500 companies, I was very grateful when I was when I retired for two reasons. I didn't have to give results reviews, and I didn't have to get effing results reviews any longer. What are your thoughts about end of year performance evaluations and uh, what works, what doesn't work, helping people to be realistic about their performance, 
uh, confirming the best in them and at the same time helping them to do better. Right. So, um, well, uh, to cut it short, I say get rid of them. Uh, as many organizations are doing, actually. I've heard they got rid of them at Adobe and, and other quite big companies. Uh, but you have to replace it with something else. Because the reasons why organizations have performance reviews, they're, they're legitimate reasons. But there are like too many reasons uh, lumped together in one practice that doesn't work. According to research, there's a whole lot of evidence that says that performance reviews do not increase performance which was the whole point of having them in the first place. Um, and, uh, and helping people with their performance, but also uh, uh, having input for salary negotiations, but also having a, a paper trail, because just in case you need to lay off a person, you have to back it up according to law. Those are all valid reasons. But there are other ways for these individual reasons to have performance appraise to, to performance appraisals to implement uh, those. And one thing that is very important is that the world is, uh, has, has sped up in, in the last few decades, and particularly in the last decade. We, we cannot wait for the end of year performance appraisal anymore. My team give each, gives each other points every day. Every day is a chance to be rewarded for your performance. I have an app on my phone that I can use to give points to my colleagues. I gave points to, to someone yesterday for uh, suggesting to take over with the help of my book tour because somebody else uh, uh, quit who was helping me and said, oh, I'll, I'm happy to help you out. Well, thank you for offering. I don't need help now, but you get five points for just offering the help. I appreciate that. And uh, that is how we value each other's uh, contributions. And if you have an, an annual thing, you cannot take into account all those micro interactions that, that happen throughout the, throughout the year. So I see HR departments moving towards such almost real-time 360-degree performance systems where people have actual real-time uh, input on, on each other. And that is uh, useful perhaps to have an annual talk about the raise. Yeah, that makes sense to do that once per year. But the performance data should be collected like every day because there's too much happening in an organization. Can I and ask you really quickly yeah, just to ahead. follow up on that? How, how do you think the quantification of what seems inherently to be a, 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 a qualitative measure, mm -hmm. how valuable another human being is to me? Yeah. Uh, how, how do you think the... the the ostensible disparity between those two ways of measuring value play out with something like a point system. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I'm sometimes I'm asked, uh, which is it's a very valid question. Doesn't it? Uh, isn't it the most popular guys get all the points? Uh, isn't it like the, the the extroverts get more points, like the introverts? Uh, could be. I don't know. Uh, uh, those those are those are good questions. But at the, um, uh, you do not only have the points, you also have the, 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 the qualitative data. Like every time I, I, I credit someone, I add a comment. Right? You get points because of your contribution, because you did this. And also we add the values of the company to those uh, uh, comments. So we can actually sele select honesty or integrity or kindness or whatever we picked as corporate values. So that means that instead of just having uh, 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 mugs or posters with the corporate values, I actually have data that says at which time which person was credited for having done something that is on our bulleted list. That's cool. and, and that is useful, I think, for as input for any conversation with HR or your manager or whatever. You can even ignore the points, but at least you have the comments that people made about each other's behaviors. So and the quantitative data gives you an opportunity to consider the qualitative exactly, data. Exactly, yes, yeah. yeah. And uh, what we do, um, uh, I, um, I showed you that we add the, 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 the money part, but that is our decision because that is our experiment to have this kind of bonus mm -hmm. system. But I know other organizations who just stick to the, to the, 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 the peer-to-peer crediting and just collect the data of comments that people make about each other. 
um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and forget about the whole money part because that is optional, uh, basically. But what, is, what I find interesting in my experience, we, I also I started the book with a chapter about kudos, kudo cards, mm -hmm. which is just tokens of appreciation, like writing people a thank you note. That is, it already has a huge effect on people. I love it when I get a thank you note for a person. But it's very hard to remind yourself to give other people a thank you note. Now the interesting thing is, what I noticed when we switch to this merit money, this peer-to-peer -peer crediting system, that I now feel the pressure of having to get rid of my points yeah. before the end of the month. So it actually works better for me than the kudos, because that was also always optional. Mm -hmm. right? But I lose my points when I don't use them at the end of the month. That's like using, losing your vote in an election. You don't want that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at least I don't. Right. So I make sure that I, I get rid of my points before the end of the month because then phew, they're gone mm -hmm. and I start with 100 again mm -hmm. next month. So that's an interesting side effect that is as a psychological consequence, at least for my behavior, uh, for complimenting people. Right. So yeah, so the quantitative aspect has consequences for the qualitative and, and, and vice versa, I'm sure. Just the power in making it a practice seems yeah. profound. Yeah. Right. And, and making it a habit. Right. That is what yeah. it, you, you're trying to make these things a habit. Uh, um, when something happens, something needs to be triggered in my brain, this deserves crediting. Oh, this is an opportunity for getting rid of some of my points. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Closer to zero before the end of the month. <laughs> yeah. Amy, I don't want you to yeah. get, give her a here, mic. Right here. Thank you. Um, I, I, you mentioned an app, and you and mentioned that you use Slack. And one of the things, so I work with large organizations to come in and try to change their culture. And they're all trying to become agile and empowering people. And it's a really difficult task in an in a established, large organization. So we're always looking for tools that shift the way people perceive uh, their power. And technology that isn't top down is a great one. So I just wondered if you had anything else to say about how um, technology first, but other things. I like the, you know, the board that shows delegation. But any ideas that sort of introduce something that belongs to the employees instead of being inherently managed top down? Well, I firmly believe that, that most change happens from individuals uh, in organizations then that then bubbles up uh, to be accepted by higher management layers. Uh, and that also means that the same applies to the tools that they, that they use. Uh, um, someone came up with this app, it's called Bonusly, bonus.ly that we use, but there are other apps, I, I, I counted six for a, by now or something that allow peer-to-peer -peer crediting on teams and most of them are, are they have free plans anyone can start using them so you don't need a manager's approval to start using this as a couple of people on a team and say hey well this looks like fun shall we experiment with this I always use the, the language of running experiments not change just run experiment let's see if this is useful for us and any team can do that and when they start experimenting with the peer-to-peer -peer crediting and make some rules, making it work better, then they can talk about it with their friends on other teams, say, hey, this is what we did and how we changed it. Maybe you can use the same tool or maybe you find a better one. And then this how then a new practice spreads until management get wins, gets wind of it. <laughs> and say, oh, well, this is, oh, wow, we actually now have data. <laughs> about people. That is awesome. HR departments love that. <laughs> uh, so it might get accepted by management layers. And um, uh, so that applies to digital tools. It also applies to physical tools such as the delegation boards that I showed you. The most are just white boards where people draw a line and put some sticky notes and you're done. You clarify the boundaries between two people or a manager and a team who, who uh, delegate work to, to each other. So yes, many of those uh, uh, initiatives, they don't start in management layers. I actually literally write in my book that management is, is responsibility for everyone, not just the managers. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, sometimes I, I, I use the Gandhi quote, was be the, be the change that you want to see elsewhere. 
uh, and that also applies to, uh, to the employees or non-managers. Ex except for the money part, they can introduce basically all the practices that I suggest in the, uh, in the book and, uh, and uh, get managers involved at a later point. At the risk of being an ideologue, um, I'm always thinking about this from a futures perspective. And it seems to me that the challenge that we all have when we talk about people wanting to feel enfranchised, feel as though they have some ownership, that there's this sort of, you know, words like agile that are used as stand-ins for these basic concepts, um, that what, what we're really talking about is the uncertainty of the future, right? That, that all of us want our sort of say on what we think will happen, right? And, and it's interesting because futurists created a, a long time ago a technique or process called Delphi, uh, where you gather a group of experts and you ask them to, to opine on the future you know, of a given subject, uh, independent of one another. And then they're read back anonymously to that group and they, they rewrite their predictions. And they keep doing this, presumably until they reach some sort of a consensus, without any of them realizing that they are, uh, you know, responsible for this or that view that's being incorporated into the into the consensus that they end up creating. This is an alternative to sort of like uh, prediction markets, right, where you have people place money bets essentially on what will happen in the future. But it all comes back to that, right? I mean, it seems to me anyway. Uh, my friend uh, Stuart Candy, who's a futurist de design professor at OCAD, and he says that all designers are futurists because we're designing things that don't yet exist. And, and we're trying to deal with that uncertainty. And so the reason that I sort of mention all of that is because one tool that might be interesting to you that I happened upon years ago was the idea of creating an, essentially a prediction market inside the organization where you create uh, a marketplace for ideas and each idea essentially has a, a, stock, is, it has a stock price, has a share price, right? Um, and, and that all the people in the organization are given funny money that they can use to trade shares in these different ideas and then the share price of each of those ideas is a, is a heuristic, is a tool for understanding the value of those ideas so that you can sort of separate the wheat from the chaff. And then if an idea gets implemented and it either redounds to the top line or saves money or whatever, you pay out dividends in real dollars to the people who invested in those, in those ideas so that people are, are incentivized to continue to invest. This is a, just another crowdsourcing yeah, yeah. mechanism. Exactly. It's yeah. another example of managing the system and not the people. And managing, was, right, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And uh, I, was, I was in the, uh, the part of the, 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 the predecessor of that practice, which was an innovation committee. Right. I remember quite well. <laughs> that was like 10, 10 years ago. We, we invited people to submit their ideas in a traditional idea box, and then the committee reviewed the ideas. And of course, we didn't accept anyone because they were all stupid ideas. <laughs> <Right. Thank God>. <laughs> <laughs> None of them made any sense. And then, well, pretty quickly, all the ideas dried up. Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that didn't really work. Yay and, committees. Uh, yeah, so that us, was us managing the ideas. And that, was, that didn't make any sense. So delegate that responsibility to the crowd, and, and that works better. So the, one mic, of the things, the mic? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sorry. Well, one of the things that you said early on in your talk that, that resonated was managers deserve to be happy too. <coughs> I think a lot of them don't realize that, and mm -hmm. and I think in a large multi-tiered organization, right, the the managers sometimes get forgotten about in terms of just being an employee, right. So in these large organizations, you have basically teams. You know, if you look at teams as peers. You know, you have managers that are peers. They're a team of managers, each responsible maybe for a different, you know, line of business or, or whatever. So I guess the question is, you know, how do you, how do you help them feel like a team and do these types of things when the structure of most organizations very explicitly has them competing against each other in their performance measures and, and what it is that they're measured against, which is not managing the system typically, it's managing the people, managing the outcome. Yeah, boy, good question. <laughs> I would say get, get rid of that practice <laughs> somehow. Um, but um, I'll, I'll give you an example of something silly that I did. Um, I, was, uh, I was forced to do these annual performance appraisals with my team. At the time, I had like four or five team members. 
um, uh, was uh, was the last was my last year as CIO. I had managed 100 people indirectly, and my last year I I sort of branched out and managed a little business unit as a, a startup, uh, as intrapreneurs basically, a new product that we developed. So I had just five people, and the annual performance appraisal came up, and I said, okay, let's uh, let's go to a restaurant. I invited them to a restaurant. I paid for dinner. Uh, we had I had the the, the forms printed next to our dinner plates and we filled them out together about each other <laughs> that was that was one of the best evenings that I ever had with with my team and they said that was so awesome that we could openly and honestly remember we were Dutch we, got <laughs> <laughs> we were open and honest well, it was sometimes difficult but it was also very appreciative and we rated each other we agreed and the interesting thing that that, that happened was, and you don't have that with traditional uh, practice, was that uh, at some point, for example, person A could say, well, I sometimes think that you have an issue with, with uh, this to person B, and then person C said, I don't agree. I think that's your own problem. <laughs> so then the conversation started about someone thinking that a person had an issue, but no, that was actually the other person who had the issue. You, you miss that kind of triangular discussion when you have just a manager having conversations with, uh, with people. So uh, I, we filled out the forms together. I signed them and I sent them back to the HR department. It was my responsibility. And the HR was happy. They had their forms. So they, could do, <laughs> they could do whatever they needed to do. <laughs> Um, and uh, I sometimes give this as an example of what another uh, uh, coach or consultant um, uh, said, uh, be the circle in the square. I thought it was a great, a great metaphor. The, the, the organization wants you to be a square and wants you to do squarey things. But, <laughs> but you don't want to be the square, you want to be a circle. And people say, I can't be a circle and a square at the same time. Say, yes, you can. You can be a circle in the square. <laughs> You can do things your way, um, but then you'll have to do some e other stuff around it to make it work for the company around you. You have to do things to satisfy the environment. And that is your, there's your intelligence is needed to make that translation. It's extra work. And he called it, it is like paying a tax. Uh, you don't agree with paying a tax. You find it completely n useless. What the, what is done with the tax, but the tax allows you to survive, basically, in that environment. And I thought that was a great metaphor. And then when you build uh, credibility that way, well, oh, look what a nice square you are. <laughs> <laughs> then you gain trust. I experienced that with my CEO. You gain the trust, you gain credibility, and then you can discuss how to make that, uh, that square, a little bit, bit less squarey, maybe with rounded corners or something, uh, to have it a bit closer to the actual circle that you want to be inside. And I've seen some great examples of, of people, people doing that in, in their own context, struggling with an, with an environment that demands silly things, but they did things their way, and someone took care of the translation, as I did. Okay, guys, we'll fill out the forms together. Someone wants these forms. Sorry, just let's do it together. I sign them. My responsibility. Everyone happy. Yeah. yeah. This uh, this point system of yours. Uh, it's not my. I came. I didn't come up with it. I just okay. stole it from other organizations. But uh, go ahead. No, this shouldn't ruin my question. It's okay. <laughs> uh, just d giving these points out in this yeah. way um, is kind of brilliant. I mean, it's. It's a little crazy. Mm -hmm. It is. Like, from American standards, anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, I was going to use the F word, but there's these little kids running around, so I don't even know if I should say that or not. Nah. I mean, it, you get five points for that. it's crazy. <laughs> Thank you. But, like, so, but because it, 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 it seems to remove expectation, but it encourages effort. Because mm -hmm. you know what's going to happen. Like, someone's going to roll a six, right? Yep. Sometimes. So, mm -hmm. it just... But my question is, like, let's say that one of us hears this tonight and we think, oh, we want to bring something like this into our organization here in St. Louis. What, how does it apply to underperforming employees? Like, obviously, like, if we have such an employee, we should have already figured that out and maybe done something to make that employee just mm -hmm. like, do better or maybe yeah. go find a job at some other place, right? Mm -hmm. 
But let's say we bring that system in now. Yeah. Like, is it just like the lowest point scorer always is going to be looked at as someone who's underperforming? How does that? How can it work in that way, if if at all? Well, first of all, I think there are two different things. Um, uh, I showed you the difference between those two quotes, well, focusing on the positive things, focusing on the negative things. They also require different practices, as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> so focusing on the good stuff, that should be public. Everyone should see it. Like all those points and all those credits and those comments, they're public for our team. Everyone sees how many points everyone else got from whom and why. That is completely transparent because it's always positive. We cannot deduct points. We cannot take points away. We can only give compliments. And those <coughs> should, be, should be public because you want to try steer behaviors and, 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 and uh, give signals to, to other people. Indeed, that does not uh, uh, handle the underperformance of some people. Yes, some people did not do a good job in some situations. Well, I cannot offer that feedback through this peer-to-peer -peer crediting system. I will need something else. I wrote another chapter, Feedback Wrap, uh, for that, which is about private feedback. Like, hey, this is what I saw happening. Uh, this is how it made me feel. Um, this is what I need as a manager or business owner, and this is my request to you. And here are some, some suggestions. Probably some of you have heard of nonviolent communication. It's <laughs> almost the same thing. Uh, I've seen the same patterns pop up in, in, in various articles, whether it's NVC or others uh, raising children. You don't tell people you did a bad job, you just tell people this is what I saw. Um, this is how it made me feel. No, nobody can disagree, uh, disagree with those facts, right? And then you say, well, this is what I need as a business owner, and then let them figure it out. <laughs> how to shorten the distance between the observed behavior and the desired behavior. And you're not putting blame on anyone. And preferably you do this privately, in a private conversation, either face-to-face -face or over email or, or, or whatever. But indeed, you can't, you can't squeeze that feedback into the peer-to-peer -peer crediting system. You, it's like a, a different channel that you, that you need. Yeah. Incidentally, Kathy Kramer <coughs> told me that you know, the fundament of her asset-based thinking technology uh, is that we, we, spend, we should spend five times the amount of sort of mental bandwidth considering what is possible, what is positive, mm -hmm. what are the assets of the situation that we're considering right. uh, to every one uh, sort of unit of mental energy that we give to considering what might be wrong. Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. I think is resonant with a lot of what you're saying. Definitely. And also what I picked up from, from the much more to people than I am uh, is that sometimes it is worth not discussing a problem because they could resolve themselves yeah. uh, by just focusing on the good stuff. Yeah. This is, that is typically systems thinking or complexity thinking. Some problems cannot be solved. They have to resolve themselves by focusing on other stuff. Emergence. Yes. And that is what happens when you focus on the good things and you, for a while you don't talk about that bad thing and it will vanish. So, because sometimes problems only get bigger because of the fact that you're focusing on them. Mm -hmm. And it has the reverse effect. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like fighting terrorism, it makes terrorism worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these, these kinds of very complex, non-linear problems that we have in the, in, the, in the world. You have that on a much smaller scale also in, in, in organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you get rid of some of those problems by, indeed, five times as much focusing on the good stuff, uh, on the good behaviors. And then some problems don't need to be discussed because, hey, at some point they vanished. And, okay, well, that saves you some time. <laughs> well, do we, have, do we have one more? I mean, I, I want to give us all time to hang out, and we're going to, we're it, presuming it's not too hot outside. It is uh, 91 degrees out there. But it was our anticipation that we might open up the roof, and so we can all spend time up there. But if the... Alex, you got a question? I have a quick question. Yeah, please. Uh, so there's a few, there are a few organizations, Zappos and then <coughs> Valve, that have no managers that you were talking about. Would you disagree with? I'm curious if you'd speak more to the system that you were talking about, because you said managing the system a lot. 
Do you have a set of constraints or a definition of that, exactly what that system looks like to be optimized in terms of being able to get the results that you're talking about in your book? Well, um, I do not agree that there are no managers because there's always someone putting constraints on the system. Even with Valve, if you read the, if you read the Valve hand, uh, uh, employee handbook or whatever they call it, there are constraints put on, the, uh, uh, on that system. And with Zappos, they in, uh, introduced holacracy. Well, that's just management in a different... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's just uh, uh, management with different, uh, uh, with different roles. <laughs> but the management is still done. Um, I, it's, I often compare it with testing. Uh, it's like you don't perhaps you don't need full-time testers if you're a software company but someone is going to have to do the testing the activity is still there so with management it's the same thing there's still stuff that needs to be managed like how do we hire people and how do we pay compensate people for what they're doing those are management decisions uh, usually so yeah, sometimes this management job is distributed across the system and we take care of it together, this management stuff. And we don't call ourselves management and that is what Holacracy has uh, attempted with their model of circles. The management job is, is vanished, it's just become management work that we carry out uh, together. So the definition of what the system is also depends on how you have uh, separated that management job, if it is uh, still a person somewhere doing management work, then he has a different view of what the system is than when you have a distributed across all employees, then they're managing the system together. But somehow they're making rules for each other. <laughs> Uh, somehow they're agreeing on what is desirable and not desirable behaviors and they will agree when you, get when you will get evicted from the company uh, for certain behaviors and that's management. management. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, somewhat? Good. Okay, good, thanks. Happy. Unless there's <laughs> anyone else, I want to thank you all for coming and uh, we are going to serve some food and uh, we may or may not open up the roof depending on whether or not we want to risk the insurance claims that might attend that. Uh, but, uh, but please stick around as long as you like and we'll, we'll uh, sort of try to keep Jurgen around as long as we can and so you can pepper him with questions and thank you all very, very much for being thank here. You, sir. Thank you.